Margavan and Melanine, and well met indeed. I am Arach Hare Galadirithan, head of the Submod Dividing Conquer, and today I bring you a lore video to discuss the firstborn of the Eruhiri, the children of Iluvatar, and that is the Elves. Now, the Elves, as I have always said with these lore videos thus far, I've always wanted them to be pertinent to the campaigns of Divide and Conquer, so if they can't be set at least almost wholly in the Third Age, they should at least be set in Eastern Middle-earth before, uh, after the fall of Beleriand, as in Dak, uh, playing Lord of the Rings, even just reading the three Lord of the Rings um, key books, the six books, you will not come across Beleriand very much at all. Aragorn talks briefly of um, Beren and Luthien, but other than that, you don't really learn too much. And that will be the same here. I will discuss the creation of the elves and what happens at the very, very beginning. But then once they've made their journey, which you'll discover in a moment, um, if you don't know much about the elves, I will then not talk about anything related to the first age. We will pick up their history again on day one of the second age with the founding of Linden, and then we'll go from there. The elves' actual history after the first age is incredibly sparse um but unfortunately the first age is almost solely about the elves that would basically be me just describing the events of half of the silmarillion so i'm not sure yet how i'm going to deal with the first age so i'm just anything first age related i'm pretty much bumping off and worrying about on another day uh, some of the Valar will be mentioned throughout this video, so I do hope in time to also give you a video which just essentially describes and names all of the Valar to use for those who aren't sure who is whom and what they do. And um, so that should give you a bit more information in the background. So as I say, this, um, this video will deal mostly with the very beginning of the elves, their journey through Middle-earth to the lands where many of them then remained until time ends, which is yet to happen. And... Then the events that happen to the elves through the Second Age and Third Age. Now, there aren't very many events in the Second Age and Third Age that I've written down at all, but we'll talk about them in bits and pieces and we'll, and we'll go through it. There's a few um, other little bits that come in. So that's the background knowledge, uh, the, well, the background of the message. The picture that you see before you is my personal favourite elf, the one whose um, deeds stayed with me after I read the books the longest, and to this day is still my favourite. And I only liked him even more when I then read the Silmarillion and linked that he is Glorfindel of both Gondolin and Rivendell. And um, he's always been my personal favourite. I like that he is, uh, the Nazgul are afraid of him and he, and he, and he shines almost as, as powerfully as a Maya. But that is for another video. Right, so the elves. The elves, like men, are created by Eru Iluvatar. He is the one. He is the... Um, the equivalent of God in Middle-earth, essentially, despite there being a pantheon of demigods and then even demi-demigods, <laughs> Eru Iluvatar is the one. He is the Almighty, the Creator. The Valar assist him in creation in the Aina Lindalie, but they, it is all through his power. And he personally creates the elves and the men. And elves are the firstborn. They awaken first. And speaking of firstborn, and then that brings us to time, it is also worth mentioning that up until we talk about the Second Age, there won't really be any mention of time. Because the elves awaken in the Years of the Trees, in 1050 of the Years of the Trees. However, the Years of the Trees are still marked by Valiant time and not by human time, or um, what do we call our own time? I can't even remember what it's called. Related to the sun, essentially. Our time is dependent on the sun. How quickly our planet rotates how how quickly we go round the sun that all just that all dictates our years and days but um they didn't have that back in day the sun didn't even exist but when the elves awoke so uh, it was done by something called valiant years and for a rough guide for yourself one valiant hour is equivalent to seven solar that's the word i want solar seven solar hours um, and then the, compli the, the calculations get more complicated as you go on. But I talk about that in a Valar video anyway, so we won't worry about that now. But just to say that there won't be any mention of years, it will just be a discussion of the events. So, that's by the by. The Valar, the first thing that happens 
um, in the elven history, as it were, is, is it's important to note at this time that when the elves awake, there is no sun and there is no moon. The lands of Middle-earth are lit only by starlight and nothing more. There are two trees that we'll talk about later in Amman, but in Middle-earth there's no sun, there's no moon. It's, it's, it's almost, it's night time indefinitely, and there are stars which light the sky. However, the Valar, and particularly Varda, who is the essentially queen of the heavens, fearing that the elves would awaken to too much darkness and thus be too susceptible to Melkor, because at this time Melkor resides in Middle-earth when the elves awaken, um, fearing that the land would be too dark for the elves and that it would be therefore easy for Melkor to taint them, Varda adds more stars to the sky. And it is said that when she adds this extra luminescence to the sky, that is the moment that the first elves awake. Upon seeing this starlight appear above them, this is the moment that they awaken. And to talk about their awakening from the um, complete history of Middle-earth, uh, there are three elves that awaken first. Now, unfortunately, their names are quite difficult to find unless you have a, a copy of um, the cl complete history. Well, you can find them on the internet now, but uh, back when I was a wee nipper just reading the normal books, I didn't even know these people existed. But there are the first three elves to arise are Imin, Tatar, and Enel. And their names quite literally mean first, second, and third. And they each awoke with a wife. So they are like the dwarves other than Durin. They awoke in pairs. And, well, they awoke in sequ sequence, but in pairs. And uh, their wives' names also mean first, second, and third, but they're just the feminine of Imin, Tatar, and Enel. And these are the first three to awaken. And they, they together, they, they come together and they move about amongst, uh, in the lands that they awaken in, which is a place called Kuivianen. And Kuivianen is said because of the changing of Middle Earth it is said that the elves cannot return to Kuivianen and it's located far in the east long in a in a far off land that you would is not on any map that we've seen and they awaken by the shores of a great inland sea Helkar so the first thing they see is the starlight and the first thing they hear is the noise of streams and rivers rolling down into the sea of Helkar because it's a large inland sea at this time but Imin, Tatar, and Enel, they move about amongst the lands of Kuivian and until they come across other groupings of elves. And the first elves they discover, Imin claims them as his people, and they become the Minyar, which just means the first. The next group they come across, Tatar claims them as his own, and they become the second. And then the third group they come across, Enel claims them as his own, and they become the Nelyar, or the third. And they continue moving about, and they... They eventually come across two more groups, but Imin, the selfless man that he is, says, thinks to himself, I claimed the first elves we came across, so I shall now claim the third group that we come across. So they've already come across three groups, and then they, they're going to come across more, they think, so Imin will claim the last ones this time. And they come across a second group, and Enel claims them, uh, a fourth group, sorry, and then they come across a fifth group, and Tatar claims them, but then they don't come across any more. So the, the Minyar become the least populous of the three starting elven clans. The Tatyar are coming second. And then the Nelyar are the most populous of the clans. The third. 144 elves initially awaken in Kuivianen. And they begin naming things, they begin talking between one another, and through this talking is how they come to name themselves. They call themselves Quendi, which you'll see written down in a few slides, so hold on for that. And Quendi just means those who speak, because so far they've found nothing else that talks in the way they do, and so they name themselves the Talkers, essentially. And uh, a rather fitting name, don't you think? But bear in mind that, or not bear in mind, but a brief mention on timeline is that one of the possible start dates of the first age is when the elves awaken. However, it's still not counted in solar years, so there's a long time before the first year of the solar first age. Uh, so just a small little mention on that. Uh, the Quendi, as I say, means those that speak with voices. And 
they they begin just discovering things in Kuvining and, and moving around and milling about and doing not much else until they are discovered first by Melkor. Um, although, actually, first of all, sorry, the, I was going to talk to you about the trees. Uh, I've I slipped them in. I talked about I mentioned the trees sli uh, slightly earlier. And the two trees are two great colossal trees in Amman, and these are the only source of light aside from the stars in the whole of the planet, in all of Arda. However, their light only extends over Amman, Valinor, the lands in the west. So Middle-earth is in, is in darkness, it's, it's, it's under the cover of starlight. Now, unfortunately, at this time, I can, off the top of my head, I can only remember that one of the trees is called Telperion. I th can't remember the name of the other one. Uh, but that's okay anyway, because I talked to you about that in a Valar video. But just read the comments, there'll be about 13 of them that tell you what the name of the other tree is. Uh, so the trees light Aman, but they don't light Middle-earth. And so the starlight is the only light. But anyway, back to Melkor. Melkor is the first of the Valar to find the elves. And he is he's all, obviously he's already the chief enemy of the Valar. And he begins sending shadows and spirits and evil powers to the Kuvian in, in an attempt to, to twist the elves. He's trying to already corrupt them. Because he claims this land for his own and he despises Eru Iluvatar. Uh, and it, so he's trying to dis, disroot. That's not really what I want to say, is it? He's trying to disrupt the creation of Middle Earth. He's trying to disrupt the pattern that was sung out in the Aina Lindalie. And so he sends spirits to Kuvian and. and and it is said that any elves that wander off from the group are said to disappear entirely. And it is also to note that at this time, it's said in the books, uh, obviously the orcs also have a second creation myth, but it's said here that this is when the elves are twisted and tainted and turned into orcs. Those elves that disappear from the group, they're captured by the spirits and, and the wraiths of, of Mont Melkor, and they're twisted to orcs in his great um, bastion of Atumno. Additionally, a second feature on this is Melkor knows that Rome, the hunter of the Valar, the huntsman of the Valar, he often wanders in Middle-earth. He's one of the few Valar that actually roams Middle-earth at leisure alongside Yavanna. And he knows that Rome goes everywhere with his horse, Nahar. And so he creates, he creates um, shadows and, and evil, evil whites and wraiths that resemble a great rider atop a horse. And his plan is so that when Arome eventually finds the elves, they will be fearful of Arome and they will, they'll be distrustful of him because they will think that he is the one that's been snatching elves when they've left the group. But it is not so. And Arome does come to the elves. Eventually he finds them and he hears them singing and he heads over to meet them. And some of them are terrified of him. They think he is this great huntsman that uh, Melkor has been spreading lies about throughout their number. But Arome, Arome says to them, I, I am, I'm not, I'm, I'm here to help you, essentially. And he's, he's in awe by the elves. He's in wonder of the elves. I'd just like to do a brief mention of the picture I chose here for Arome. And that is that if you ever look for Valar, they are almost always drawn like elves. Sometimes they're larger, like enormous the size of skyscrapers. Other times they're like natural and they have trees growing out of them and i've seen a few pictures of arome where he looks like a um he looks like a tree human but they always have the pointy ears and they always look like elves and i'm uncertain as to why that is unless of course because the valar can essentially choose their form unless it is that whenever they appeared before the elves when the arome first saw the elves and when the rest of the valar first saw the elves they wanted to appear the same as the elves so as not to dis not to upset them not to disrupt them so, and then ever after, we then always think of them as elves. But I can't find too much to say that they actually look like elves. If, uh, I mean, of course, they are formless and shapeless. They can do what they want because the Maya can do that as well. Um, but they, why they always choose to look like elves, if that is indeed the case, is beyond me. But that's by the by. Arome finds the elves. He returns to the Valar and tells them of the elves. And then he comes back. The Valar have counseled they've spoken amongst themselves and they've decided that the best way to save the elves from the threat of melkor is to bring them to aman so arome heads back to deliver this news and he chooses amongst their number three ambassadors from the three clans minyar tatya and nelia and these three ambassadors are ingwe finwe and elwe they're depicted here ingwe the chieftain of chieftains 
Ingwe Ingwerion uh, is the gentleman with the golden hair. Elwe, who becomes Thingol and um, his history is interwoven with the First Age, is the gentleman with the silver hair. And Finwe, the father of Fionor, the great and famed elf, is the gentleman in the middle with the black hair. Now, trying to get a picture of those three that was not anime was horrifically difficult. So that's why I've settled on this one. But anyway, Rome chooses these as his three ambassadors and he takes them back to Amman where they see the light of the trees, they meet the Valar and they are overcome. They can't believe the beauty of this place. And of course, if you've spent your whole life in darkness, seeing light for the first time, proper light that lights up everything, must completely blow your mind. And so they head back and they, be they counsel their clans and they, they try and get, get them to come with them to Amman. It is also that the three ambassadors then become the kings of the Valar, and that's why their names are known far more than Imin, Tatar, and Anel, who were the first three elves. The names of Ingwe, Finwe, and Elwe are known far more because they become the, the kings, the high kings of each of the three clans. And on the next slide, you will see the clan names. We'll talk about that. But um, they do manage to get the elves to go, and the elves agree to go on this great journey. But this is when the first sundering of the elves takes place. Uh, oh, I've clicked the wrong one. Click left instead of right. And the sundering of the elves is as follows. Many elves do want to go to Amman. They, they're really interested in, the, in what the three ambassadors have to say. And they, they agree to follow them. However, some elves do not. And they refuse this journey. And these are the elves that then ever after become known as the Avari. And as always when talking about elves, it is definitely worth mentioning that the Avari are not evil. At all. They just merely don't... They enjoy the... It's said that they enjoy the open lands of Middle-earth. And essentially it's the, it's the grass is greener on the other side problem. They don't know for certain that the other side is going to be better than where they are now. So they opt to stay. And the Avari are made up of a small number of Noldor and a small number of Teleri. Now, you wouldn't have heard these names, so I shall explain them to you. The three kings, Ingwe, Finwe, and Elwe, who is um, over here, they are the leaders of now the three clans whose names have been changed to Vanyar, Noldor, and Teleri. They may still call themselves Minyar, Tatyar, and Nelia. They all have different names for themselves. But the names as we know them are Vanyar, Noldor, and Teleri. The Vanyar, it is said, are the highest of the elves. They were the first to awaken after Imin, Tatar, and Anel, and they're the, they're the highborn. And they are marked by golden hair. Golden hair is a trait of the Vanyar. Uh, the Noldor, it is said, are the deep elves, and they are friends of Orle in time. They'll be friends of Orle, uh, the chieftain, the smith of the Velasrame. And the Noldor are led by Finwë. And as I say, half of them refuse the journey and half, uh, not half, sorry, um, a number of them refuse the journey and a large number of them do go. And then finally the Teleri. The Teleri make up almost all elves that aren't Noldor or Vanyar, bar the Avari. And the Teleri are led by Elwe. Now Elwe is his brother and uh, their, their histories sort of entwine as it goes on, but they're, at this time they're led by Elwe. And a, a small number of them remain, but a large number go on the journey. So the Avari stay in Kuivinin and essentially drop out of the history of Middle-earth. We, of course, have done some work into making the Avari appear in Dorwinian. Uh, but that is pure fan fiction, I'm afraid. There's no evidence there are elves in Dorwinian. Uh, Kuivinin was far, far to the east. F it essentially... I'm fairly certain I can say that um, walking from Dorwinian to Linden is further than walking from Dorwinian to where Kuivinian was. And of course, remember in that Tolkien writes that it is said that Kuivinian cannot be returned to. So there's also suggestion that the Avari would struggle to make their way west. But um, some of them do. Some of them do before the world is changed too much. And they eventually mingle with the three tribes you see beneath them. The Sindar Nandor of Falathrim. Or the Nandor, really. But most of them remain in, the land, in and around the lands of Kuivinian. So, you've got the Vanyar, Noldor, and Teleri, and I've slashed it with Falmari, and there are three other options over here. Now, these are collectively known as the Kala Quendi, as you can see above. Oh, and this is the spelling of Quendi, by the way. Now, Kala Quendi means light elves, or elves of the light. And this is because these three clans 
all see the light of the trees. They make it to Amman. Um, we continue, we'll talk a bit more about their journey in a second, but they all make it to Amman. And the reason I've spit Teleri Falmari is because as we go on, we will see that a large number of Teleri do not make it to Amman. And indeed, even Elway, their king and their ambassador from time before, he doesn't even get to Amman. He's already been, of course, but he, um, he remains in Beleriand for reasons we see later. So his brother Olway becomes the leader of the Teleri in Amman. Ingwe is... It's also to mention that Ingwe is said to be the highest of all elves. And he is the high king of all kings. So each of the three clans does seem to have a high king. But Vanyar is said to be the highest king of them all. He is the greatest of all the elves. And it is also said that all elves revere Van the Vanyar and especially Ingwe. So he's kind of like their, their great leader. The Noldor have as first their leader Finwe, and then they have a separate leader for Aman, who um, is Fingolfin, I believe, uh, or Finarfin. I've not got my little uh, my little notebook out. Fingolfin or Finarfin is either the leader of Aman, and then there are about six high kings of the Noldor in exile, which is ends with Gilgalad in the Second Age, uh, in the Last Alliance. Yeah. Elrond does not take the high king title, as far as I am aware. That's by the by. So the Moraquendi is the collective name for the elves that do not see the light of the trees and are so-called the elves of the darkness or the dark elves. And this is the point that I try and hammer home in all the videos that I've ever spoken of this, is that they're not evil. They're not dark elves like you know from almost every other fantasy thing. Apart from, of course, um, the lands of uh, Morrowind where they're dark elves purely based on their skin. But in Moraquendi, they're dark because they didn't see the light of the trees. They're not evil. And uh, the Teleri can be split down into these into these key factions. The Sindar, as you should all know, are the main elven body that makes up Beleriand until the Noldor return. The Nandor, as we will see in just a moment, I'll talk about them in a second. They follow Lengwe, and they have then their group, their number become through time. They become the Lyquendi of Assyriand, which is Beleriand based, and the Sylvan elves of Lothlorien and Mirkwood. So their Lorien and Mirkwood are separated far, far in time from the Noldor. Who then eventually return. None, none of the Vanyar ever return to Middle Earth save for um, an army raised by the Valar in the First Age, but they none of them return to live. And we're not sure that the Vanyar even can participate in the Val Valian army, so who knows. But the Vanyar stay and they reside at the base of Mount Taniketil, which is the highest point in Amman, and at the top of it is where you will find Manwe, the chief and greatest of the Valar, second only to Melkor and Varda, his mistress, the Queen of the Stars. The Noldor reside in a place called Tyrion, up top um, Tuna, which is a hill, and there is, they build a city for themselves there. And the Teleri, as we will see in a moment, they reside um, on an island called Tol Eresia. And eventually they move onto the mainland of, and they build the Swan Haven of Alqualonde. So those are, this is the Sundering of the Elves, that's what it's known as, because the Avari remain behind. We continue on. Right, so they're, we're back to them walking on the great journey. They're all heading west. And they come across the Hithyaglir, which is the name for the Misty Mountains in Sindarin. You can see it just there, Hithyaglir. And they come across it somewhere up here near the Anduin. And so the Anduin, the mountains, and the forest are three great things they come across all at once. And in, the elves walk really slowly on this journey because everything is new to them and they're taking in everything. And they come through this mighty forest, they've never seen anything like it. And then they come to a river they've never seen anything like before. And then they come to mountains that they've never seen before. And the mountains are raised by Melkor with the aim to stop the Great Journey. He tries to deter them at every stage. And Arome heads off and he leads the Vanyar and the Noldor and they go through the mountains. But the Teleri are more cautious and they linger by the Anduin. And it is at this time that Lengwe leads some of the elves away it might be just Len Wei without a G actually uh, and he leads some of the Nandor and they head south and Lorien will take some time and Mirkwood take some time they live around the Anduin for now but eventually they do become the Sylvan elves of Lorien and Mirkwood unless other elves are just dropped into Middle Earth there can't be any other conceivable reason that there would be elves in Mirkwood and Lorien who aren't Cinder so the, the, these elves that part now and Avari that may have followed on from the west, they become the Sylvan Elves. But eventually, 
um, the Teleri do head over the Hithyglia, led by their king Elway. So the, the now diminished number head over Ithyglia and they move through Eriador and they head over Eridluin into the lands of Valerian. And they wander, because they haven't got a Rome as a guide at the moment, he's still with the Vanyar and the Noldor, and they wander around in Beleriand. And until Elway, their king, comes across a wooded land called Nan Elmoth. And in within it, he finds a Maya called Melian, who he falls instantly in love with, completely smitten by her. It's said that they stand still staring at each other for um, essentially what would be like thousands of human years, and they just stand there in silence. But none of his elves can find him, and they deeply love their king. The elves are all about loving one another. And um, so they're searching relentlessly for Elway, which tarries them even longer. Which keeps this group of Teleri in Beleriand longer than the Vanyar and the Noldor. And Elway eventually remains in um, Beleriand, and he takes the name Thingol. I believe it becomes Elu Thingol. And he marries Melian the Maya, and through their lineage... Um, or through almost all the High King's lineage, someone that you know from the Third Age is related to these three original kings. And um, Elway Marins ma marries Melian the Maya, and so their children are part Elven and part what is essentially demigod. But I'll talk about the um, Maya and the Valar in, the, in their own little video. But Elway and Melian have a child called Luthien, who is the daughter, the girl from the song Beren and Luthien that Aragorn speaks of in the third, third Age. And then through their line, through their children, even come Elrond and Elros and then Aragorn himself. Uh, a long, long way down the line. So, um, through a ridiculous length of blood changing hands, you could even say that Aragorn would have some tiny part of Melian within his bloodstream. So somewhere in, in Aragorn is a tiny part of Maya because his forefathers were the children of Meli and the Maya. But anyway, the Vanyar and the Noldor, they've made it to the shore of Beleriand. And now Ulmo, the, the Lord of the Seas, the Valar of the Seas, comes forth to them. They can cross an ice bridge called Helcarax, which connects Amman and connects Middle-earth in the far, far north. And it is just a shifting ice plane and it's said to be really dangerous. The ice is really unpredictable. You can just die there from the frost. So they come to the shores with Arome as their head and they call upon Olme to take them to um, Aman. And he does. He sails them there on an entire island. He brings an island to the shore of Beleriand. They all jump on it and then he sails it, in inverted commas, to Aman. And they get off and they reside in Aman. Of course, the Teleri are left behind, but eventually the Teleri find Elway, and Olway, his brother, still decides he wants to lead elves to the shore and to Aman. So some more Teleri go off, and those that remain become the Sindar, as you saw in the sun sundering section. So Olway continues on, and they arrive at the shores of Middle-earth, but they reside here for a very, very long time. And they come to befriend someone called Osse. O double S E with the two dots. And Osse is a Maya under Olmo, and he's kind of the representation of storms on the sea. He's temperamental. He can be your friend one second and then he'll be a raging enemy the next. And he represents the storms and the and the unpredictability of the ocean. But they befriend Osse because the elves of the Teleri then come to the shore where they come to love the sea. The Teleri, it is said, are the elves who revere the sea the most. And they come to the shores and they fall in love with the ocean. And, and they befriend Osse. But eventually, even they wish to cross to Aman, and they call again, Osse calls upon Olmo to take them across to Aman. So he brings back this island once again, and they climb aboard and they go. But again, some elves stay behind, and these are the Falathrim. And they are led by a man whose name you should all know, because at the time of the Lord of the Rings, as far as we know, Círdan is the oldest elf in existence. And Círdan is the leader of the Falathrim. There's the image of him there on the screen. And the Falathrim just means coastal folk, or coastal people. And Círdan becomes their leader, and they become the great mariners. And he, So he becomes the first leader of the ship elves, essentially. Which is why he's such a great sea elf. Brief note on Círdan. It's written in the Lord of the Rings that Círdan's one of the only elves that has a beard. And it is said by Tolkien that a beard will only grow on an elf who is of such a great age or concern 
that time has either wearied him through time itself or the actions of the land have wearied him themselves. So elves are said to only age if they come under great stress. So visibly they would, if there were no evils in the world, every single elf, be they 20,000 years old or 30 years old, would look almost identical. But it's said that Círdan is the only elf, to, well, he's, only, he's one of the only elves we know to have a beard and this is through time. Because whilst we aren't certain that Círdan awoke at Cúavianan, it is certainly suggested that he was one of the second or third birthing birth uh, children from Cúavianan. So his parents may well have been one of the original 144 elves. Or indeed he may have been one of the original 144. It's not clearly written. So, Círdan leads the Falathrim, but the other Teleri all get on to Toloresia and... As I said, they befriend Osse, the Maya, and they are sailed to Amman. However, upon arriving at Toloresia, Osse is sad, because if they make it to Amman and they go into land, then he won't be able to speak with them that much, because Osse is the shores and he resides on the shores. He doesn't really go inland. And so he beseeches Olmo to, to stop the Teleri just before they arrive in Amman. And Olmo agrees, because on two reasons... The first reason is that when the Valar originally spoke to decide the fate of the elves, should the elves come to Amman or should we leave them over there and just let Melkor get on with it, Olmo was one of the few who spoke against bringing the elves to Amman. And that's not because he didn't like them. He's one of the Valar who likes elves the most. Olmo is said to be the greatest friend to the elves. And... Um, he, because he wants the elves to sort of remain in Middle-earth, he agrees with Osse. Uh, there is only the one reason, sorry. Um, uh, well, And also partly because Osse gets on with them so well. But he agrees to allow the elves to remain, and the island is anchored just off the coast of Amman, to the, um, just off to the east of the great mountain of Tanaketil, and it becomes Tol Eresia, the lonely island. And the Teleri reside there for a great amount of time in their in their city there. I think it's called Alvalon. And then eventually they do then, thousands and thousands of years later, they do eventually go to the mainland of Amman and they build the Elven Haven, the Swan Haven of Alvalonde. And so, and they finally arrive in Amman. And that concludes the great journey. So they've walked from the east to the farthest west, and in that time, they've created the Sylvan, the Sindar, the Falathrim, and the Avari. They're all left behind. They haven't got these names yet, but they're all left back in Middle-earth. And the elves of the Great Journey all arrive in Amman, thus concluding their journey. Alrighty-ho, so then we, as I say, we won't talk about the First Age at all, and now there are very few points left. On the first year of the second age of Middle-earth, so now we're really into the, into the time that we all know. We are talking something like five, six thousand years after the um, first year of the recorded first age. Even more so than that because of the years in the years of the trees are longer. But the second age, the first year of the second age, after Beleriand has fallen, the lands of Linden are founded. Just here. Um, and also at this time, but we're not. I'm uh, from the books that I, could, I had gathered around me when I was doing the research on top of what I already knew. Just to fill in the dates, trying to cut down on the people telling me I'm wrong. Um, Mirkwood and Lorien are also founded around this time by Sylvan Elves, like properly. So they may have resided here for some time, but now Beleriand has fallen and humans are really starting to take hold. Uh, the elves seem to then return to their forested lands. So Linden is founded in the Second Age One. But then nothing really happens in the elven history for 750 years until a small group of the Noldor break from Linden and they create Eregion, the lands of Eregion or Holin, over here just west of Moria. Mliadris is still not existing at this time. It still doesn't exist at this time. So they create Eregion. Their leader is Celebrimbor. And Celebrimbor is the grandson of the greatest elven smith to ever live, Fëanor. And so Celebrimbor, quite naturally, is therefore a very talented smith. And he creates the Gwaith y Myrdain, the smith, the um, jewel smith's guild. Or just the jewel smiths, can't recall. Uh, and that's in Oregion, which you should all know, as that's the little guild building you get in uh, Austin Ethil, the town of the elves. 
So the Noldor then flourish in their own way in Linden and in Oregion. Uh, they'll be, by now, the the elves that survived the fall of Beleriand will be a mix of Noldor, Sindar, Balathrim, who were Teleri, Sindar, of course, were Teleri, Lyquendi of Ossiliand. They all would have formed to create what is now an amalgam, amalgam of different clans. So they're not purely Noldor, but they do follow Gilgalad as their high king. Because Elway is, is no longer there. He's no longer there to lead them. Olway and Ingwe are back in Amman, so they can't lead them. So they follow, at this time, Gilgalad, the last of the High Kings of the Noldor in exile. But in the year 1200, Sauron the Deceiver comes to Eregion and wins over the Elves. Now, I call him this because at this time, Sauron can still decide how he looks. Um, after he betrays Middle-earth so heavily, um, whatever power it is that does it, forces him to take on a look of disgust so that he can never again trick or deceive anyone. But at this time, he still can control his form. And he comes to the elves as this great and wise smith, a friend to them, and somebody they can learn from. And the elves of Eregion, who ever hunger for further knowledge, they have that same trait of Celebrimbor's grandfather, they welcome him and they, they begin to teach and learn from Sauron. And they learn of the power of the rings and how to create them. And in 300 years later, after the teaching of Sauron permeates through, they create their, the rings, the nine, the three, and the seven. Although the three, I believe, are made sort of in secret, Celebrimbor kind of catches on to what Sauron is doing, and so he, he creates the three elven rings separately so they aren't under the power of the one. But then, as you all know, 100 years later, so it's a, a process of 100 years to create all these rings, the one ring is created in the Second Age, 1600. And instead of getting a picture of the ring, I thought I'd get up an inscription of what is inside of it. Of course, you all know what it is in English. One ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness, bind them. But in the black speech of Mordor, it is Ashnazg Debatuluk, Ashnazg Gimpatul, Ashnazg Thrakatuluk, and Ag Barzamishi Krimpatul. And that is the ring inscription. I also wrote down the actual inscription or got the image of it because it is a perfect example of Tengwa Tetar form where you can see that these little dots above the lines are the vowels. Uh, Tengwa is something I can actually write fluidly in but unfortunately I can't prove that on the internet whereas I can speak Sindarin, I can't speak Tengwa because it's a, it's a written form. But um, these are the vowels and they all go above a following consonant. So at the start here obviously it all begins with Ash. So the A goes above the SH. And that's why there's a little three little dots above there. So it's Ash, and then Nazg, and then Dabataluk throughout. So there's the ring inscription. Sorry, I, I could talk for ages about Tengwar and Sindarin, but I don't want to. I just wanted to briefly touch on it. So the one ring is forged in 1600. And the elves, knowing that this has finally, Sauron has deceived them greatly. 93 years later, a war is had between the elves and and Sauron and he comes to Eriador in force and he unfortunately destroys Eregion completely. Now I think this is because they either hide the rings from him um, or because he just he, he hates them he does hate them so even though he's deceiving them and going against their number he hates them all the time and so he just seeks to destroy them and he's a, a probably a little annoyed that they sussed out his plan and the three elven rings do not fall to his power. But Gilgalad does send Elrond. Two years into this war, Gilgalad sends Elrond on a force to aid Eregion, but they arrive too late. And in 1697, Celebrimbor is killed, Eregion is destroyed, the Gate of Moria is shut forever, and Elrond founds Imladris, the last homely house east of the sea. In 1697 of the Second Age, Imladris is founded, so it's not that old. Imladris is actually quite young in the lifespan of the elves. And here, the Noldor from Eregion flee and reside, and a few others may come from um, Linden, but it is, it's not a great city, Imladris. It is just a, a small hamlet, a, a house, a large manor house, and some of the elves come to live there. And three years later, at this time, Eriador is now overrun. Sauron has dominion, essentially, over Middle-earth. What he is seeking for, some what will it be, 4,300-odd years later. He already has. But 
Throughout the Second Age is the time of Numenor, and at this time the Numenorians return in number, and under their king Tar Minastir, and with an army of Gilgalad, they eradicate the orcs from Eriador, and they cleanse it, and it remains free for a very, very long time, until the um, Witch King, uh, uh, quite a long time later. But Tar Minastir and the Numenorians of Gilgalad, they cleanse Eriador, and this is in the year 1700. And unfortunately... For the next 1,700 years, nothing really happens until the last alliance is formed and the elves join with Elendil, Anarion and Isildur and they of course besiege Baradur and the Great Tower is brought down in 3441. But Gilgalad perishes and Elrond takes up the lead of the remaining Noldor in exile but he does not become the High King as far as we can tell. He doesn't take that trait. And that ends the Second Age, and now we come to the Third Age, where the history of the Elves is really, really low. After the Last Alliance is when the Elves start to leave. They've had enough of Middle-earth, they can see that men are now rising with no great threat on the horizon, and they begin their journey away in Tuaman. Uh, but at this time, Elrond marries the daughter of Galadriel and Celeborn. She's called Celebrian. And with Celebrian, he has twin sons, Eladan and Elrahir. They're born in, I think, about Third Age 100. Uh, or no, 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 that's when he marries Celebrian, but obviously that doesn't really matter the years then. But And then they have Arwen as well. So Arwen is the youngest of the three children, but they're all born in the Third Age. So in the life of an elf, Arwen is really, really quite young. Given that her father is something like six, seven thousand years old, she's only three thousand years old by the time of the War of the Ring. Uh, maybe even less, I think, two thousand four hundred or something like that. But uh, anyway, by the by. The next event for the Elves is in the Third Age 1000, and that is the coming of the Istari. And this is only relevant because Círdan, the great and oldest Elf who is still living, he survives the downfall of Beleriand and he takes up residence in Linden. But because he is of Teleryn origin, he is not revered as the High King. Gilgalad is, is said to be higher in blood than him. But Círdan resides in Linden, where he becomes the master after Gilgalad dies. And in the year 1000, the Astari arrive in Linden, and Círdan, sensing their great mission, he gives one of the three elven rings to Gandalf. This is Naya, the Ring of Fire. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. And Gandalf takes the ring, and so the three elven rings at the time of the th uh, War of the Ring are held with Gandalf, Elrond, and Galadriel. And Galadriel um, has held the ring since she was giving it when it was created. She's always had a ring. And this is because of her incredibly high blood. Uh, a small little snippet because I always find it interesting. Galadriel is descended from all three clans of the elves and she has Mayan blood within her. It's absolutely ridiculous the link that Galadriel has. She is, she is in there with them all um, through her many connections. So Galadriel is, is quite possibly the highest blooded elf of Middle Earth, um, given that she is part Maya and part, and then a part of each of the clans. But anyway, so she has a ring, Gilgalad has a ring, but he passes it to Elrond before he dies, and Círdan has the third, and he gives it to Gandalf in the thousand in Third Age, a thousand. And then 975 years later, the elves again partake in the history of Middle Earth with the Battle of Fornost and the defeat of the Witch King, which is covered extensively in the Arnor and Gondor video. So I'll just let you have a brief little image look at the picture there. Uh, of course, they defeat the Witch King, and Glorfindel has his prophecy, and the elves are victorious there. But then again, nothing happens to the elves particularly of note until 3019, the War of the Ring. So about a thousand years later. And this is because in 3019, what you may not know, alongside the attacks of Minas Tirith, the Battle of the Pelennor Fields, the uh, Battle of Helm's Deep, um, the attack on Erebor that I covered in the Dwarven video, Lorien and Thranduil are also attacked <clears throat> in 3019. Lorien is attacked three times. And if it is said that if Sauron had not fallen, the orcs would have been so rallied and so great in strength that Lorien would have fallen. But Lorien is attacked three times, but they hold back the enemy. Mirkwood is attacked and there is said to be great battle under the trees in the north, but they do defeat the orcs. And after this victory, Celeborn and Galadriel, with a great host of Lorien, sail across the river and they utterly destroy Dol Guldur. 
It is said that Galadriel herself brings down its walls and lays bare its pits, are the words that are used, and Dogledore is destroyed. And then in April of 3019, Thranduil and Celeborn and Galadriel come together to decide the fate of the forest. Or I don't think Galadriel does because she goes, but they come together to decide the fate. And the eastern side of um, the eastern side, the southern section here below the East Bight becomes Eastern Lorien and is joined with Celeborn's realm. And north of the mountains here, and I believe slightly to the road possibly, it becomes Thranduil's realm. And the central forest is given over to the Woodsmen and the Bjornings. And Lorien and Thranduil and Mirkwood are cleansed of all orc filth. And the forest becomes known as Erun Lasgallan instead of Mirkwood, which means the forest of green leaves or the wood of green leaves. And so that's the events that happened to the elves in the 3019. All we know is that they're attacked, I'm afraid. I've got no other information on it than that. They're attacked three times and there's great battle under the trees. And then, as I say, Galadriel leaves with Círdan, with Elrond, with Gandalf, with Bilbo and Frodo. They leave on the same ship out of Lond Linden, Mithlond. But Celeborn does not. And to be quite frank, it's not 100% certain that he ever leaves. Um, I didn't look into the twins' history, but Celeborn resides in Lorien, ruling over West and East Lorien, until eventually even he grows tired and he returns to Rivendell, where he resides with his grandsons, Eladan and Elrahir, because, of course, his daughter is their mother. And he resides in Rivendell, and that's the last thing we know of Celeborn, so he may journey over the sea with the twins. He may not have done. We're uncertain. And... After the um, victory against Sauron, Legolas, the son of Thranduil, who we all know so well, leads a small contingent of elves and they settle in Ithilien, where they create a small little colony of elves, um, which is very curious given that um, all the elves are potentially leaving now. But some of them break away, they smoke, make a small colony in northern Ithilien, and I think they just seek to replenish the forest from the great many years that it, it has been burnt and destroyed and pillaged and ravaged. And the elves rebuild Nathalian, essentially. But they would eventually, too, either disappear and fade into mystery or go west to Amman. And such is the fate of all elves that they will one day, whether they wish it or not, they will reside in Amman. For the death of an elf takes them to Amman anyway. So unless, But of course, given that they are immortal, unless they are killed by another's hand, they will reside where they choose to. So the Avari do just pass into myth and... and and just exist in the east and there's those that don't journey to Amman or die also do reside here somewhere but as I say they pass into mystery and that is the history of the elves that I wanted to talk about barring the first age in Blur. I hope this one has been as enjoyable as the ones before again please feel free to leave as many comments as you will they are greatly appreciated but until we speak again dearest friends Navar Naden Perimad Melunin and fare thee well. Oh no, I tell you what, just for those who stayed even beyond the farewell, the elves revere starlight above all else because it is the first thing that they awoke and they saw. And the Sindar gave a name to Vardar called Elbereth. They called her Elbereth. And they revere starlight so much they grow a great many songs to commemorate the stars, but none is so famous as the Elbereth Gilthoniel taint the Song to the Stars, which for those of you who have remained to Beyond the Farewell, I shall read for you now. And this is just a this is just a, a worship song to the stars itself, but it is entirely in Sindarin. And it goes as follows. A Elbereth Gilthoniel, Silivran Pena Miriel, O Menela Glar Elanath, Nachaired Palandiriel, O Galathremin Enorath, Fanwilos Lelinathon, Nefayar Si Nef Iron. And as such the elves pass into history. Farewell, dear friends, Navar and Quiomai.